Hey everybody, welcome to DRTV. I'm your host, Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. And this is the above the pay grade portion of our show where we like to have on people who are smarter than we are, which is why today we're talking with Casey Luskin, research coordinator at the Discovery Institute. Casey, thanks so much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me on, but if you want people who actually are smarter than you, I could give a few recommendations. I don't know if I'm the guy you're looking for, but <laughs> well, you know, I, I, you've I got appreciate that you- Well, you've got like 700, I speak in hyperbole. You've got like 700 biology books in on your back shelf behind you, and that, Mine, I don't have that. I've got like, <laughs> I've got like bad paperback fiction, you know, adventure. We all have our little, our little weird obsessions. And mine is biology <laughs> textbooks. What can you say? So. That's, that's great. Oh, Casey, this, uh, oh, we, we know better. We know better. We're familiar with your writing and your work at Discovery uh, Institute. And in fact, you uh, recently wrote a piece that really kind of brought you back to our attention. And that is you wrote a review of Bill Nye's latest book. Bill Nye, of course, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Who I love Bill know? Nye as a yeah, kid. Yeah, Bill Nye. Watched all his stuff. So Bill has a new book. It's called Undeniable. And it turns out, Casey Luskin, you found quite a bit that's um, deniable. Tell us about that. Yeah, and you know, before I say too much critical of Bill Nye, I want to kind of say what you guys were just saying. I mean, I was a Gen X, millennial generation type person. So I grew up in the, in the 90s where I would watch Bill Nye's, sci you know, Bill Nye the Science Guy, his after school TV show, and it was hilarious. I mean, I loved his corny jokes. <laughs> I loved his offbeat, wacky humor. I'm yep. a, I, you know, slapstick is my thing. I thought Bill Nye was hilarious. And he would make you laugh. You would learn about science. What's not to like about Bill Nye the Science Guy, the, t the after school TV show? When Bill Nye was talking about things like, you know, how do we pop a balloon with heat or how do we, you know, dig into the earth and find rocks? I mean, this is all just normal good science. Bill Nye's show is great at just helping you to understand basic high school science chemistry experiments. There's nothing wrong with any of that. And so we're, what we're talking about here with Bill Nye is sort of a different side to Bill Nye that maybe a lot of us who watched his TV show in the 90s didn't know about. On the, in the, just the last few years, he started to unveil sort of this different side of himself that he's, he's basically this sort of hardline, evolutionary, divisive, atheistic worldview that he wants to promote on society and push upon kids. And so this is sort of a new side to Bill Nye that we didn't really know about when we were watching his show back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And now he's starting to really unveil his, his, his true agenda, which is to push this evolutionary worldview upon, upon kids. And so we should be aware of this. We should be ready to understand it and understand that when he starts talking about all this evolutionary sort of propaganda in his book, that we should become more speculative. This is different than the Bill Nye we were talking mm -hmm. about in Bill Nye the Science Show of, of the 1990s. So you're saying we shouldn't trust his book then if we want to go out and read it. Well, what we should do is we should read it, and we should read it with a critical eye. And that's really how you should approach anything. I'm not saying absolutely everything in his book is wrong. There actually are some things I, I agree with in his book, but there's a lot of it that gets into sort of uh, evolutionary speculation and what I would call anti-religious sort of you know evolutionary atheism. Hmm. And so we should read, like we read anything, read it with a critical eye, be aware of what he's saying, be ready to understand it, and uh, critique it if necessary. So yeah, this is not a knee-jerk reaction. We should understand his book and see if there's some stuff we accept and some stuff that we're skeptical of. Um, so Casey, get, get to the heart of it for us. And, and you've said it a couple of times. Um, the issue is this, uh, this sort of atheistic, materialistic worldview. Um, describe, what, what does that entail? Why, why is that the point at which you're, you're, you diverge with Bill Nye? Because it sounds to me like that's more like a philosophical um, assumption he's making. Is that what you're taking issue with? Well, that's part of it, but you know, philosophical assumptions will translate often into the way that you interpret the scientific evidence. And so in the case of Bill Nye, he'll say, look, you know, the human body is full of these uh, components and parts and organs that are poorly put together, that are poorly designed. And what he'll do is because of his philosophical preconceptions that human beings are just a random speck in the universe that evolved for no apparent reason, that there's no purpose to life, he'll then look at our bodies and he'll interpret you know, certain parts of our bodies as if they don't have any purpose either. Uh, we can get into this later, but he talks about the human eye and he claims that it's poorly designed and poorly wired. And because of his worldview, he's interpreting the evidence in a certain light. Now, when you actually look at the way our eyes are built, when you actually look at the science behind our eye, you can see that Bill Nye is actually wrong. So his worldview is leading to bad assumptions about the science, 
which leads to wrong scientific conclusions. It's sort of garbage in, garbage out type thinking. When you start with you know, better assumptions, you can understand what's really going on in the science. Let me give you a perfect example of Bill Nye's worldview and what I'm talking about. In 2000, a lot, I bet a lot of your viewers have no idea that in the year 2010, Bill Nye was named Humanist of the Year by the American Humanist Association, huh. okay? No so clue. did you know that? That's an interesting factoid. So you can actually go online and you can watch um, Bill Nye's acceptance speech, and here's what he says. He says, I'm insignificant. I'm just another speck of sand. And the Earth, really, in this cosmic scheme of things, is another speck. And the Sun, an unremarkable star. And the galaxy is a speck. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck among other specks, among still other specks in the middle of specklessness. I suck. <laughs> so this is Bill Nye's view of humanity. Literally, he thinks that we suck because we're the result of a series of cosmic accidents that have no meaning, and our Earth is just floating through space with no meaning whatsoever. Now, of course, science, so th he's making both a philosophical claim there. He's also making some scientific claims that our position in the universe doesn't matter. Both his philosophy and his science are bad when you compare them to the evidence. And we can talk about that, but this is where Bill Nye is coming from. That's so depressing. Like, why would you even want to live if you're just like, I'm a speck on a speck of a speckless speck, speck, I suck on a speck. Yeah, I, mean, I, just, I guess my question then is, why even do science? Why? Casey? Yeah, why hasn't even he bother? Just, hasn't he just like cut the legs out from his own uh, agenda? Why do science? Why is it important that this spec teach other little specs, little kids, that, that they're, they're just specs. specs? I mean, what exactly is the point of all this? Well, yeah, I mean, look, from a, from a Christian perspective, we understand that it was the Judeo-Christian worldview that gave birth to science. It was because intellectual geniuses like Isaac Newton and... Bacon and all of those early scientists believed in an all-powerful creator who was supreme, the supreme intelligence. They believed that he would create an intelligible, rational, comprehensible universe that they thought, I can go out and study the world around me and it's going to make sense. Hmm. So literally, it was this theological view that came out of the Western Judeo-Christian you know, you know, way of thinking that there is a supreme intelligence. It was that view that gave birth to science itself. So yeah, in a sense, Bill Nye is sort of cutting the legs off of, you know, what the, this worldview that gave birth to science. But you have to understand there's another side of this coin. Bill Nye doesn't understand any of that history of science and religion. He's probably completely unaware that it was the Judeo-Christian theological foundation that gave birth to science. But where he's coming from today is because he thinks all that exists is matter and energy that is basically sort of worshiping the created things, all right? Mm. He thinks that all that exists is the created things. And so when you start to have a worldview like that, your hope of salvation is in nature itself. It's almost pseudo-pantheistic when you begin to think that there's nothing more that exists than matter and energy, so the hope of my salvation comes from studying that matter and energy, so all I can do is hope to find you know, scientific answers to life's biggest questions. So he thinks that the only way, really the hope of humanity's salvation lies in science alone. And look, I'm a huge fan of science. I mean, look, we have light bulbs, we have computers, we have internet. These are all great things. I love science. I love what science has given us. But the hope of humanity's ultimate salvation, you know, I'm not what you call a believer in scientism, mm. which is the belief that every th science solves all of our questions. So science solves all of our problems. Science can do a lot of good for humanity, but we need to consider more than just science when you're trying to figure out what's going to work to make humanity better. I mean, you could have solve all of our scientific problems, and there's still going to be war, there's mm. still going to be evil, there's still going to be suffering. Science is never going to solve, you know, really what's at the core of humanity's problems. And so Bill Nye thinks that science can solve everything at the core, and that's where he's going to be chasing this rabbit for the rest of his life that he's never going to catch. Mm. You know, I think there's a lot of hope in, in knowing that, I mean, from our, from our side, and yes, uh, uh, Casey is a proponent of intelligent design. We are fans of intelligent design. And we're not necessarily fans, but there's so much hope in intelligent, in knowing that you believe that a God created this world specifically so that we can know it and know him better as a result. Like, he... That's sort of I the mean, foundation of science. It's sound of foundation <laughs> of science, but there's a reason... That we're, that we're digging into this that's really, really encouraging. And, and we're supposed to dig into this instead of trying to go out there and seek and find our value in something else and then still just die and turn into a speck. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> depressing.
That is so depressing. Casey, Casey, you work at the Discovery Institute, uh, which of course is an organization that is that uh, heavily promotes the concept of intelligent design uh, in the scientific guild. And you got a lot of colleagues there, Stephen Meyer course has written um, some blockbuster books on this topic but perhaps you could give our viewers just give us a brief introduction to what intelligent design is and I'm gonna have a follow-up question to that that maybe you can even anticipate um, is it really science um, people the, the the general criticism is that it's not really science so ad address those two things for us sure yeah so intelligent design is a scientific theory which says that many aspects of life in the universe are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than an undirected cause like natural selection. And I do very strongly believe that intelligent design is science. There's a number of different ways we can show why intelligent design is science, but let's talk about one of my favorite. Um, one of the best ways to know if something is science is if it uses the scientific method to make its claims. Mm -hmm. And intelligent design uses the methods of science to make its claims. It's based entirely upon empirical evidence. It's not based upon using some kind of argument based upon religion or faith or divine revelation. So let me tell you what I mean. I mean, how does the argument for intelligent design work? Well, intelligent design theorists begin by making observations of the world around us. That's how the, the scientific method starts. It starts with observations, then you go to hypothesis making, then you do experiments, then you form a conclusion, okay? So ID starts with making observations of the way the world around us works. We can observe how intelligent agents operate when they design things. We can observe the kind of information and complexity that's found in intelligently designed objects. And what we find is that when intelligent agents act, they generate something called complex and specified information. I know that's kind of a jargony term, but it's basically something that's unlikely that matches a specific pattern. So for example, the words, the sound waves that are coming out of my mouth right now are very unlikely. The odds of you hearing these words are very unlikely, so it's complex. But at the same time, they match a pattern that you recognize as belonging to the English language, so you recognize them as being designed. It's both complex and specified in that it matches a pattern, okay? Mm. So then we make a hypothesis. If a structure was designed, it will contain high levels of complex and specified information. And we can then perform a number of different types of experimental tests upon natural objects, like, say, uh, proteins. We can look at the amino acid sequence of a protein and see that it has to be very finely tuned. You have to have a very precise sequence of amino acids in a protein in order for it to function. So in a nutshell, what, what's going on is you have an unlikely sequence of amino acids hmm. that is specified to match a very specific pattern that's necessary to get a functional protein. So what we see in, in biological systems from the top to the bottom is high levels of complex and specified information. And we can detect this high CSI, as we call it, through uh, experiments called mutational sensitivity tests, where we mutate the amino acid sequence of a protein and find out just how finely tuned or how specified that sequence has to be in order for the protein to work. And so then what we do is we come up with this conclusion that biological systems are full of high levels of complex and specified information. But where in our experience do high CSI systems come from? Where do in our experience mm. do information rich systems come from? Well, in all of our experience, they have only one known cause, and that's intelligence. Hmm. So we infer back that an intelligent cause was at work, okay? So that's using the scientific method, starting with, you know, first, first uh, premises right. with observations, making a hypothesis, testing it with experiments, forming a conclusion, and of course, like any scientific theory, we hold our conclusions tentatively subject to future discoveries. So right there is a scientific argument using the scientific method for intelligent design. I didn't use any faith mm -hmm. or divine revelation or appeal to religion or, or divine authority in making that argument. Instead, I relied entirely upon the empirical evidence, the scientific method, and using observations, hypotheses, and experiments to make a conclusion. This is science. So if you can somehow you know, see where I snuck in the religion or the faith or divine revelation into that argument, then maybe you could say that what I'm saying is, is not science. But what I just said, there's none of that. It's entirely science-based. It uses the scientific method to make its claims. So for that reason, I very strongly think ID is a science. It's not something that's using you know, faith or right. divine revelation. It's based upon science. Wow. Wow, that was fascinating. I, always, I like uh, your, your, your colleague, uh, Stephen Meyer, um, of course, he, he brings up his, I love this other analogy he uses for, for our experience. He says, you know, if you stumble across the Rosetta Stone in the sands of Egypt, 
this beautiful ancient stone that's got three different um, uh, uh, types of writing on it. You stumble across this stone. Nobody stumbles across it and says, look what wind and erosion did. You know, exactly. I, I love that. It's like, no, you know. It's information. It's complex. Somebody created this, right? Ex exactly. When we make design inferences every day of our lives, I mean, you see the Rosetta Stone, you know that that did not arise by unguided processes. You go to Mount Rushmore, you immediately recognize <laughs> that this... This is not just a, an unlikely shape of this mountain. It also matches a pattern. It's complex and specified information. The pattern is the faces of four famous presidents. You know, every time our, a right now as we speak, the Aaron Hernandez jury is deliberating whether to convict him of murder, right? right? Well, what they're trying to decide is whether to make a design inference. They're trying to decide whether or not an intelligent agent, Aaron Hernandez, is responsible for the death of a person, uh, Odin Lloyd. And so if, if they, I don't know what they're going to decide, maybe they'll convict him, maybe they won't, but let's say hypothetically that they do convict him. They're making a design inference. They're saying this intelligent agent is responsible for this set of events. And every time that, you know, uh, crime investigators, crime scene investigators will look at a dead body and they have to decide, okay, did this person die from natural causes or intelligent causes? otherwise known as murder. They're mm. literally trying to make a design inference. So we make design inferences and appeals to intelligent causation every day in our lives. So what ID theorists are saying, look, if we can make inferences to design in all these other fields, in archaeology, in forensic science, mm. in just basic everyday life, why can't we also do this in biology where all of life is based upon a language-based code and guess what? Language-based codes in our experience always come from intelligence. So I think we have a good reason to perhaps see if we can detect design in biology. Wow. So with all of this, I mean, I love it. Because, you know, the, you look at the systems of the planets. You look at the rotation of the Earth around the, the seasons, the growth cycles with, with agriculture. I mean... The complexity. It, and of somehow it just yeah. sort of showed up. But regardless, um, all those systems are in place, and yet there's such... We see this, you just made the case, we see this intelligence everywhere, and yet there's so much pushback. There's so much passionate rejection of the idea of, of, the of the idea designer, yeah. So where do you, is that, is that a rejection, do you think, of the intelligent designer himself, or do you think it's coming from something else? What are your thoughts on that? It, you just asked a really complicated question. You know, why, if the evidence for intelligent design is so powerful, why are there many scientists out there who disagree with that? We get that question all the time. People read a book by Stephen Meyer, they read something that an ID theorist has written, and they say, look, this, this scientific case for design is extremely powerful. It's, it's really just, you know, it's, it's an argument that is, has got to be true. Why do so many scientists question and disagree with intelligent design? It's a very reasonable question to ask after you've looked at the evidence. And the answer, I have to say, it's a complicated answer, okay? Yes, part of it is that there are scientists out there who, frankly, their worldview is along the lines of Bill Nye. They have an atheistic worldview. They don't want to consider the possibility that there's actually a, a designer out there that exists. It doesn't fit into their worldview. That's true for some people, but it's not necessarily, you know, the full explanation for why all scientists disagree with all ID. One of the main uh, d dynamics we see in this debate has to do with what the famous historian of science, Thomas Toon Kuhn, called paradigm resistance, okay? Right. Thomas Kuhn is a very famous historian of science. In the 1970s, he wrote a University of Chicago Press book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what he said in that book is that basically, when, when a new paradigm comes up to challenge the reigning paradigm in a scientific field, scientists of the old guard who are defending the old paradigm they will tend to be intolerant. That's the exact word he used. Hmm. They are intolerant of new ideas that come up to challenge sort of their power and position and prestige of this old paradigm that they're defending, okay? So in this case, what's the old paradigm? It's evolutionary biology. The new paradigm is intelligent design. And it's challenging some core aspects of the neo-Darwinian evolutionary paradigm, namely those which say that unguided mutation and random uh, I'm sorry, random mutation and unguided natural selection are responsible for creating most of the complex features we see in life. ID challenges that core of the Darwinian paradigm. And so you see a lot of scientists who are inherently intolerant of this new idea that are challenging, that's challenging sort of the core of their, their evolutionary scientific viewpoint. And of course, there's worldview issues that get mixed up as well. 
you also see another interesting dynamic going on as well. I would actually say that the, the majority of scientists really don't have strong feelings about Darwinian evolution versus intelligent design. They can do their research just fine, regardless of whether, you know, ID or Darwinian theory is true. This is true even for many biologists, molecular biologists, who are just trying to understand what's going on in the cell. How does the cell work? They don't need to consider, they don't need Darwinian theory to do that research, okay? Right. But here's what's going on. When a vocal and influential minority of elite scientists create sort of an atmosphere that is very intolerant towards intelligent design, what that tells these other sort of rank and file scientists is, look, if you affiliate yourselves in any way, shape, or form with ID, you are now going to be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And we have seen many cases of discrimination and persecution against pro-ID scientists over the last 10, 15 years, where as soon as somebody comes out of the closet and says, you know what, I agree with intelligent design, immediately their career suffers. We've seen people mm -hmm. denied tenure. We've seen people denied jobs, denied funding. We've even seen students denied their graduate degrees once it came out that they were skeptics of Darwinian evolution and supporters of intelligent design. Wow. So this scares a lot of rank and file scientists into just avoiding ID like the plague. And these are people who might actually be very open to considering ID and because of the sort of political um, intolerance that a certain vocal group of evolutionary biologists has created and this atmosphere of intolerance many scientists are afraid to even consider you know the possibility that life was designed so they just go along with their work stay away from id if anybody asks they tow the party line oh yeah I, I, intelligent design it's not science you know but they don't really they don't know much about the issue hmm. and frankly they don't use it they could care less it has nothing to do with their research so we see these dynamics at work where there's a lot of forces that prevent people from being open to the evidence for ID. That having been said, it's not the case that no scientists support ID. There are plenty of highly credible scientists with, you know, as, as credible PhDs and, and doing research and publishing in journals as anyone out there. There are plenty of scientists like that who do support ID. So it's not the case that there are no scientists who support ID. You can see in the scientific community, you know, at the highest levels of scientific credibility, support for intelligent design. Yeah. Wow. So I, that's sort of a, it's a complicated question you ask, so it sort of requires a it is. complicated answer. That's such answer. a thorough answer, though. I know. It's it fantastic. is a complicated <laughs> question, but I can't help noticing how much human pride plays into it. Like, we have to be right. If our, if our old things, um, if, if, if they yeah. get threatened, you know, we'll, we'll take any passionate to, to, to keep them at the top. I mean, yeah, it's I just, mean, Casey, Casey, you completely had me at Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific <laughs> Revolutions. I know that Jay didn't, Jay didn't have any clue what that I'm was like, all huh? about, no. but I, I was, like, totally, totally digging that. And I like, I, what I like about you actually bringing up Kuhn is that it shows me the Discovery Institute and you – have a really broad picture of where you're at in terms of the public debate about science, that, that you are at a particular stage in a paradigm shift. And I think that's important to, to understand where you're located, you know, in terms of these, sort of these things. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we don't get too emotional when people don't agree with intelligent design. We realize that, look, any new scientific theory is going to face this kind of paradigm resistance. So our job is not to get stressed out about it, but to continue to do scientific research, mm. continue making the case, promoting our views as best as we can with civility and respect for those who disagree with us and making an argument with integrity. That's what we try to do. And if people, you know, we, we, we have seen increasingly more and more heads over time are turning in our direction. We have certainly seen positive changes. We just have to keep doing what we're doing. And I'll tell you one of the most encouraging developments over the last maybe five or 10 or 15 years is that what we have seen is that Darwinian evolution is becoming increasingly critiqued in the mainstream peer-reviewed scientific literature. Oh. And in many cases, the critiques that are being made are the same kinds of arguments that we're making. We're like, hey, we said that first, <laughs> all right? We were saying that. But you know what? Some folks are catching on. Now, the difference is that a lot of these sort of materialist scientists who are publishing these critiques, they don't say that ID is the right replacement theory right. for Darwinism. They're coming up with these sort of new evolutionary models. Now, 
I think it's going to be a while before they come around and say, you know what, these new evolutionary models, they don't work either. Right. So we're going to consider intelligent design. But we can see that people are moving closer in our direction, and that's very encouraging to see. So you've got some momentum. So that's important in a paradigm shift is to Have snowball momentum. and get the, some momentum. The right? trend line is moving in our direction, and that is what's very encouraging. Oh, that's great. Now, Casey, where can people find out more about you, your work, uh, the Discovery Institute, intelligent design, and uh, kind of follow up with this interview? Sure. So the best place to go to learn about Discovery Institute's intelligent design work is Evolution News and Views. It's our news site. We have daily articles that keep people up to date on the issue. It's evolutionnews.org. In fact, we didn't even get into many of my, my scientific criticisms of Bill Nye. If you go to evolutionnews.org and you search for Bill Nye, you can find my full review of Bill Nye's book, Undeniable, there. So again, the website is evolutionnews.org. Sort of though, if you want your one-stop shop for everything in the whole ID world on the internet, go to the website www.intelligentdesign.org. That's intelligentdesign.org, and you can find all about our podcast, our news site, and also Discovery Institute's ID program, the Center for Science and Culture. Fantastic, That's Casey. Awesome. Thanks so yeah. much for coming on the show. And oh, and it's been a lot of fun. Just teaching us. I mean, yeah, it's just it's great really... to hear this and understand all, all the stuff going and, on. And you this. remember at the beginning of this interview, he said he wasn't so sure he was smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great interviewers. You know how to, you know how to bring it out. So yeah, I, right. I don't think we needed to work very hard. <laughs> That's right. We did. Uh, to follow us on Dead Reckoning, please go to www.deadreckoning.tv. We have social, all our social media icons are there. You can stay in tune with everything that we're doing by subscribing to our mailing list or following us on Facebook and uh, checking out all the other content that we are producing on the brand. To follow me on Twitter, Jay Friesen. And I'm at Brian G. Matson. And you can follow, of course, Dead Reckoning at D Reckoning TV. Please check out intelligentdesign.org, Casey Luskin, everything that he's doing over there at Evolution News. I'm Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. And this is DRTV. TV.